As an Evertonian, you'll definitely know your history. We sing about it at every game in one of our famous battle hymns, and so it's fitting that we're here today to talk about the distinctive tower at the heart of our crest. The adjacent Everton Toffee Shop gave us our famous nickname, of course, while just around the corner in Everton Village, you will find the almost sacred Queen's Head pub site, where a name change meeting in 1879 saw the fledgling St. Domingo's Church football team become Everton FC. The rest, as they say, is history. Well, Rob, ancient Everton Village was very much an entity in its own right. Um, there was nothing between Everton Village on the hill and the town of Liverpool down below except meadows and fields. So it, one, it must have been a wonderful place to consider walking up to if you lived in the town down below. And what was there to actually do in the village in terms of recreations at the heart of the village? Well, you know, there were most important for people coming up. There were at least three pubs in the village of which the Queen's Head would become one of them. Um, there was actually, we talk about now, um, coffee shops being a, something of the modern era, but there was something called Halliday's Coffee Shop at the bottom of Everton Village, um, where the great and the good used to meet and have their meetings. And there were churches in Everton Village. Um, and of course, it was, a, it was a beautiful village. There were, there were nice cottages, uh, the whole length of the village. And I take it you, you'd have views down to the Mersey, sort of, a sort of wonderful vista from there, looking across towards the rural. It was tremendous. I mean, um, there was no, obstruct, no obstructed views then, no high trees to block your, your view as there might be in the modern Everton Park. Um, from the bottom of Everton Village, you can see literally right down into the town of Liverpool below. And there are some great artist impressions of, of, the, of the beautiful mansions that ultimately came across the hill as well. So it was, um, it was a, a really a lovely place to come and visit. And for those people not wanting coffee, you, you did touch on that there were some establishments selling alcohol. So um, what, what, were the, what were the places that people would have gone to for that? Well, I think, you know, um, obviously mainly, ultimately, uh, the Queen's Head was one which becomes significant in, in Everton's history, ultimately. But they didn't just come up uh, to go into the pubs. You know, some of them would, would walk across the ridge of the hill and they'd picnic on the hill. Um, so families came up as well as, as well as individuals. It must have been quite a busy place in the evening, though. You know, it was quiet in the day, this little hillside village, but very, very busy in the evening. One location in Everton, Ken, that had a special place in the history of Everton Football Club is the Queen's Head Hotel. What, what is the story of that establishment? Well, of course, it wasn't a hotel. It was a, it was a, it was a local pub. Um, you know, the, what became the Queen's Head Hotel um, had many sort of different uses. First of all, it was a cow house, which was unusual because don't forget, you know, you didn't get your milk delivered on your step in those days or be able to go to the supermarket. So um, you'd go to, to, that, uh, to that building with a jug and you'd get your milk from there. But beyond that, it became a dairy. So it was a multi-use. Eventually into the 1960s, um, that particular building became the Everton Labour Club. So it had quite a history, Rob. So, so what role did the Queen's Head pub actually play in the story of Everton Football Club, Ken? Well, in terms of Everton Football Club, it was you know incredibly historic. It was literally the birthplace of big time football on Merseyside. Um, in 1879, the St. Domingo's uh, football team committee probably had the captain there. It certainly had uh, the first secretary there. His name was John W. Clark, and his father was the manager of the Queen's Head. So it was natural that they would hold their meetings there. But that particular meeting in November 1979 must have been quite remarkable if you know I, I'm always asked sometimes if I could go back in time what were the two things I would do well obviously the first one would be I'd want to be in Goodison Park when Dixie got his 60 but then the second one would be I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at the Queen's Head Hotel that night in 1879 when St Domingo's opted to change their name and became Everton Football Club. And why do we think they got to this point where St Domingo's was no, no longer the suitable name for the football team? Well, I think straight from the start, football was beginning to grow in popularity. It would have probably started with you know, 10, 15 people watching them instantly, you know, you know, in the first instance. And then that would have gone up to you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Um, I think it just dawned on somebody uh, at the club, maybe uh, the secretary, John Clark, um, that they, you know, they, they needed to, 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 to sort of widen their opportunity. And so they had that meeting, but it must have been an interesting meeting because there were other options, Rob, for the name. Yeah, I mean, obviously they went with Everton, but it could so easily have been Walton. It could have been presumably named after 
maybe Stanley Park or even blimey it could have been named as well as Liverpool Football Club couldn't it so well, absolutely the course of history could have uh, could have changed yeah it's because one of those you know sliding doors moments because St Domingo's are playing in Stanley Park it had two district borders it had it bordered with Walton it bordered with Anfield and um, but of course the St Domingo church was in Everton itself and so yeah that night they could have easily become Anfield FC they could have become Walton FC but as you said god forbid they might have become Liverpool FC might have done us a favour in the long run when we think about it. I can it. just imagine the end of that <laughs> meeting where the lad's sitting there and he said, Everton FC, every hand goes up for Everton FC and it's a unanimous vote. And then, of course, the next shout would be, get the alien, we're closing, the pub's closing in a minute. So Last orders. it would have been quite a night. Sadly, can the, the Queen's head, along with much of Everton of the past, went the way of the bulldozer in the 1960s and 1970s. But you yourself hail from... Everton and have a, an intense interest in the in the history of it. Um, you led a project, I believe, to go back to the site of the Queen's Head and sort of do some archaeology to look back at that sort of critical point in the club's formation. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, well, the project was actually with the Everton FC Heritage Society, jointly with the Friends of Everton Park. And it was an amazing day. Um, initially, we spoke to Dr. Mark Adams, the lead archaeologist uh, at National Museums Liverpool, to see if he was, he was interested. And it was quite a day. I think we were both there on that day. It was quite an emotional day as that sort of excavator started to dig down through various layers. I think, first of all, you know, it's, we started to dig up the, uh, the Welsh slate and some from the roof of the pub. Um, you know, and then we were working our way down. And then finally, when we reached that point where the Queen's head um, but you know, obviously was. It was quite amazing because we did find some amazing things. What what did you sort of find at that level? Well, it was obviously things uh, that you'd expect to find in a pub at that time. There were oyster shells because we think about oysters as a rich man's dish, but in those days it was you know it was a common delicacy for the working class man. And um, we found tiles that would have been uh, in the pub, and um, probably in the room that night. You know, with the Saint Domingo committee. Um, but the most intriguing thing we found um, was a stoneware inkwell. And as soon as it came up, I just looked at, you know, I looked at Mark Adams and said, it's not, is it? And he knew instinctively what I was talking about. You know, could that have been the inkwell where in 1879, the St. Domingo's committee signed off the change of name to Everton Football Club? So we've got that. And so for me, um, you know, the, the museum will have many treasures, but for me, as a football fan and an Everton fan, that is just something that's amazing to have. So the Queen's Head may have been gone now for about five decades, Ken, but we're lucky that there are images uh, available that we can look back on to understand the geography of Everton Village. I think we've got one here that we can look at. So we've got a lovely print here, Rob, um, of Everton Village in the early 1800s. It's an amazing picture, really, because you can see the cottages on either side. You can see the steepness of, of, the, of the street, really. You know, but you didn't have to have the freedom of Everton to drive the sheep <laughs> up Everton Village in those days. Um, and of course, you know, we can see the village cross in the middle of the street, uh, there, in the middle of the village. And you know, the, ir the ironic thing was that the Queen's Head pub was directly opposite what was Molly Bushell's first cottage in, um, in Village Street. And of course, Molly Bushell and Everton Toffee goes hand in hand. To this day, isn't it, with the, with the yes. toffee lady that we still have on match day. Absolutely. In, in, indelible link with, with the village. Um, I mean, what, what is the story of, uh, of Bushel and her, her magic medicinal sweets? Well, she was a very young girl when a local doctor gave her what he claimed to be a secret recipe um, for Everton toffee. And in the, in the, in the years that followed, um, the people who were running the Everton toffee shops became quite you know, brilliant at marketing, really. I've got a, an advert here um, which shows um, the Everton Toffee Shop being advertised and the incredible statement that Queen Victoria uh, used to order Everton Toffee. And of course, you know, the, other, the other thing they used to put on their adverts, and it must have been true, was that um, you know, the great Charles Dickens, the famous author, he used to come for Liverpool, to Liverpool and stay at the Adelphi Hotel he'd speak brilliantly about his books at St. George's Hall. But he must have wended his way up to the Everton Toffee Shop, at least on one occasion, because they started to use his name in the adverts as well. So, With or without his approval, yeah. With or without his <laughs> approval, yes. 
And the, and the claim was that these were effectively a sort of cough lozenge, as well as being hopefully delicious to uh, to suck or chew on. They they were supposed to be a sort of throat lozenge that would uh, yeah. ease sore throats. Yeah, him being a doctor, he told her that you know she sucked these um, the Everton toffee recipe you know, that she made from his recipe that they wouldn't sort out sore throats. So um, they had every angle covered really, and you know the um, the importance of Everton toffee you know the, uh, became tremendous really, and there's no surprise ultimately that Everton would become the toffees. Yeah, the nickname stuck. Um, but the toffees we have now, of course, are nothing like. It's probably worth doing a disclaimer that uh, the, the current humbugs, striped humbugs that you see as Everton mints are nothing like probably what Molly was manufacturing a couple no. of hundred years ago. I think the toffee she made were kind of the toffee that, in, in my memory, the kids used to bring to school that their mothers used to make, you know, good old fashioned brown, sticky toffee. Um, yeah but clearly very tasty. And I still like an Everton toffee, actually, Rob. Absolutely. Uh, and it's wonderful that that tradition has continued. A lot of people now, probably when they think of the toffee lady, either think of the mascot we have on match day, going around the pitch, throwing the sweets to the, the supporters, or, or the George Green caricature that appeared in the page of the Echo, or he's on the football Echo, the wonderful caricature that he did of that sort of mother noblet figure that, uh, that appeared. And if Everton won, she was dancing a jig of joy and if Everton lost you was sort of bursting a balloon. Absolutely. Um, but the kind of error a lot of people have made down the years, it's, it's actually appeared in books as well, some books, is that Molly Bushell actually um, went to Everton and was, you know, the original toffee lady. Of course, Molly Bushell um, never actually saw Goodison Park, never actually, she was never the first toffee lady at Goodison Park. She died decades before that. Um, but the toffee shop continued from that little um, cottage in Everton Village to the toffee shop that we all remember in the great pictures, um, or, or, you know, below Bryce Browside and above Netherfield Road. And of course, there were not just one toffee shop, ultimately there would be three toffee shops in the city. And presumably sort of relatives and various successors and competitors were sort of churning out these uh, confections in, in the decades that followed. Well, it was mainly Molly's, um, you know, grandson as well, particularly. And there was a toffee shop in London Road and there was a toffee shop in West Derby Road. We know West Derby Road now for the famous Grafton and the entertainment and everything that goes on there. But there used to be a toffee shop um, just opposite there and um, facing what used to be um, the zoological gardens. It's hard to imagine it now that Everton had a zoological gardens, um, but we did. And so, um, yeah, Everton toffee became hugely popular locally, nationally. And as you said, Rob, um, that's how you know we people people in other cities gave us he started to talk about us as the toffees and that's where our famous name came from like the toffee lady throwing sweets to the crowd the toffee lady comes round like this before every match at Everton There's even a history in a bag. So Rob, when did the Everton Lockup Tower first appear on the Everton Crest? It was six decades on from the formation of the club that uh, Theo Kelly, who was the club secretary at the time, sketched um, a version of the Lockup Tower that's on the brow to become the club's symbol. But actually, if we go back to the 1890s, the Everton letterhead featured the Everton fire beacon, which um, was on the sort of highest point in Everton and used as a, it was lit up as a navigational aid. So even as far back as the 1890s, the letterhead was making a nod to the village of Everton. But as I say, it was 1938, just at the dawn of the championship winning season with Joe Mercer and Tommy Lawton, that Kelly sketched a representation of the lockup tower albeit not a very faithful representation of it. Yeah, so let's be clear, you know, he was the stroke secretary, first manager, alleged manager of Everton Football Club. So he wasn't an artist. Um, so when he did that drawing, it was he, he made it slightly longer. The tower looks slightly taller than it is. It's much stubby than that. And you're right, Rob, a few years ago, the club tried to uh, move to a scenario where they that we returned to the actual shape of the Everton lockup tower and it didn't go down too well because we always talk about knowing our history and fans are very protective about their history and so they decided to stick with the you know the tower that we actually see on the badge now another interesting thing 
1938 that was that Kelly also created the club's motto as well as the badge so the nil satis nisi optimum was introduced at the same time so 1938 was clearly a, an historic time for the club but it was another I think four decades before the crest with the, with the tower appeared on the shirt I think it was 1978 so it's it's quite odd that we had that crest for four decades we didn't use it except on paperwork programs maybe parts of the stadium but now the, the shirt would be it'd be remiss not to have the the famous lockup tower on the on the Everton shirt and what a good luck charm it was Rob because we talk about 1938 and you know the that crest being created for the first time of course we won the league championship that Absolutely. year and with, with one of our greatest teams as I say Tommy Lawton Joe Mercer Ted Sagar TG Jones the greats yeah the greats certainly my dad's favorite team but amazing really that we didn't actually put it on the shirt for another you said another yeah another four decades amazing. prior to that we sometimes just had EFC in the 1920s mm -hmm. and then in the 70s finally we had I think a sort of EFC just lettering on and it was as I say 78 before they, they took the plunge and actually put the crest proudly on on the shirt brilliant so Rob we've talked a lot about our history so why don't we go up to Village Street the birthplace of big time football on Merseyside let's do it Here we are, Rob, at the site of the Queen's Head Hotel. It doesn't look much now, does it? But, no. you know, this was the birthplace of big time football on Merseyside. Um, there were lots of, uh, the, the, in the village, there was full of cottages, but, you know, there was pubs and, you know. That's right. And I believe just across the way there was Molly Bushell's first cottage. The starts with the toffee shop, Empire. That's right. That's where, that's where a doctor gave her the secret recipe to make her Everton toffee. And uh, yes, of course, that's where it all started for her. And in the middle here, you'd have had the village cross sort of marking the sort of centre of the village. The village cross stood right in the middle of the street. I think it was more of a sundial than a, than a cross. Right. Um, but it was the kind of place where kids and people would gather in the evening and things like that. It was removed quite secretly one night and sort of disappeared. But that's another story. Okay. And behind us, I believe, was the Queen's Head Hotel. Yeah, at this level, this was the this was the ground level where the Queen's Head Hotel would have been. Um, so it was an it was a amazing place. Should we go and take a look? So the hotel was around here, was it, Ken? It was actually out on the road. What has happened is during the 1960s clearances of all the streets here, they've done a lot of mounding. So before the archaeological dig could actually reach the foundations of the Queen's Head Hotel, you can see here. We had to go down and actually about 10, 15 feet uh, with the excavator. But we got there in the end. I went in to meet Dr. Mark Adams and he was very keen to come here. He'd, he'd been digging Roman sites, Greek sites, all kinds of things. But to come here and find the birthplace of big time football um, was an amazing thing. And of course, he achieved all of those aims. Well, Rob, here we are at the 1787 Everton Lockup Tower. Sometimes people call it St. Rupert's Tower, but that's not when it's late, is it? You know, Prince Rupert, who came here with his uh, in, in the English Civil War, um, never actually saw this tower. Uh, he was here in 1644. But even in 1787, it's such clearly stood the test of time. It's going to say Lockup, but what are we talking about for it? So the usage. Well, you know, this was a popular place to come for people from the town down below. They come through the meadows and the fields up here. Um, visit, obviously, some of the hostelries in Everton. And if you're having too much of a good time and didn't want to go home, then um, we just locked it in here overnight and they'd go down to the magistrate's court for next day. Before they'd sleep it off in here. They would sort of sleep it off in here, but yeah, as you see, it's not very pleasant, so I don't think you'd make that say a premise day again. But actually, you know, this is the tower that's on the heart of Everton's crest. And so from a football perspective, it's absolutely crucially important. I have the key, so we go inside. Let's start.
once that door gets locked this is pretty dark in here be quite frightening I would think certainly basic yes yeah amazing they didn't have the benefit of the candles around the floor <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously no window no toilet and um, if you've been in here once Rob you wouldn't want to be in here again learn your lesson yeah this remains the oldest structure in Everton and in many respects you know it, I find it strange that it was so long before we actually had it on the crest really it's amazing and even photographs of players you were telling me that you couldn't find anything with Dixie Dean anybody like that featured by it it wasn't until the 1990s maybe that there was a a closer connection on film. Well, in the 1980s, the great Brian LeBone, who for me remains Mr. Everton, um, I brought him here um, because I was writing an If You Know Your History heritage trail that would take in things like St. Domingo's Church and the Sandon Pub, obviously our original Anfield ground when we rule the cop, yeah. strangely. <laughs> and obviously our two pitches, Stanley Park and Priory Road, and then on to Goodison. And we did that route with Brian. It was tremendous. And then we sat in the, uh, in the Stanley Park stand and we had a good hour chatting about the past and he, he loved the history of the club. And then later, um, I think Dave Watson was the first one to come here in 1995. Yes. For the cover of the Evertonian magazine. I remember it well, yeah. He, Ronnie Goodless came here more recently to do the cover of his book, fittingly entitled Blue Nose. And then I remember, I think it would be a decade ago now, Roberto Martinez came down here to light the lights well that was an amazing thing when robert when roberto martinez was manager and um, we illuminated this tower blue of course during the winter months and then um, Mar uh, martinez turned up at the top of everton village we started to play the Z cars theme and he walked down followed like he was like the pied piper of everton <laughs> with you know hundreds of kids following him to a stage here and then he spoke really emotionally about the history of the club i was very impressed with him that night for doing that absolutely and, and what I love now is that this ongoing connection that we still have at our show, but also if we look outside from here, we can see the new stadium at Bramley Moor Dock rising up. So there's that physical visual connection. Yeah, we've got, we've got that beautiful vis visual connection. We'll have to see how we can exploit that moving forward um, as we move to the new stadium. Uh, incidentally, Duncan Ferguson came here when Everton did. They, they, they overtook, they took over rather, the If You Know Your History run from here. And Duncan came here with Neville Southall, and uh, it was a wonderful day. He actually ran in the race um, from here to Goodison Park and Stuart Barlow was in with amongst the fans as well that day. That's wonderful. So many connections ongoing. Yeah. So long may it be on our club badge, Rob. Absolutely. And long may this stand in Ed the district of Everton. So Ken, earlier on we were up by Molly Bushell's first toffee shop, her cottage up the hill there, where she perfected the art of Everton toffee. But I believe the second shot was literally very close to this lockup tower. Actually, Rob, it's, it's literally reach out and touch from here. It's just on the other side of the path. And it was the iconic building that everybody remembers. And so, you know, the question is there, why did we knock it down? Long gone, demolished, an act of vandalism. But we have that enduring link with the toffee lady every day at Goodison. Online. Absolutely. And, and hopefully we keep that tradition going. Um, and, you know, obviously we've, we can record the fact that the toffee shop was reached out and touch thanks to this famous tower as well. So really, we can't be any closer to the heart of Everton's badge here. So should we lock it up for another day? Let's do it.